Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius podcast, now part of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation. My guest today is James DeGregory. He's the Courtney C. and Lucy Patton Davis Endowed Chair in Lung Cancer Research, part of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. And we're going to talk about uh, cancer and carcinogenic conditions that promote it. James, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, tell me, how did you get interested in cancer and how long have you been working in it? I, I guess I've, I've always had some interest in cancer. I, it probably really got started in, you know, in earnest when I was in high school. So my, I think I was in 10th grade and my biology teacher, who was just a fantastic biology teacher, uh, so I was in high school in Houston, and she took us to MD Anderson, and we basically got to hear a lecture from, I don't know who it was, I couldn't remember that, but it was it was basically a lecture on what cancer was and why it was, you know, a, a worthy adversary and what we should do about it, and I kind of got hooked from that point on. I think what's always fascinated, fascinated me about cancer is that it's basically, you know, a, a development of... Um, a malignant clone that happens within us. So it's our own cells going rogue and not obeying the normal signals within the body. And so trying to understand that, I think, can not only tell us something profound about sort of the normal controls on our cells, but how those co controls can be subverted. So when you talk about uh, carcinogenic environments, wh what is that? What are the elements needed to create such an environment that you've observed? So essentially what we would argue is that it's, it's really pretty simple that, you know, what, what really prevents us from getting cancer, which I think is sort of the other side of that coin, is, is a normal environment. So we obviously evolved to not get cancer, at least through our reproductive years, because, you know, the, the goal of, of natural selection is to maximize reproductive success. So you need to have fit bodies and bodies that are unlikely to, you know, die from intrinsic reasons through the period when we are most likely to pass our genes on. And for humans, that's probably somewhere in the order of anywhere from the 40s to about 60, depending on how you see the value of humans in terms of our, our future generations. And, and, and so what this tells us, this kind of provides an explanation for why we maintain our bodies and why we also avoid cancer quite well. You know, we have trillions of cells and yet we rarely get cancer in the first half of a century of life, which is quite the feat. So 
when we think about why that happens, it's not just by avoiding mutations. We now know that we're loaded with oncogenic mutations, even by the time we're 50. They're happening throughout our whole life, but somehow our body is able to keep those oncogenic mutations in check. And so we'd argue it's the normal tissue environment that basically favors normal. It favors the normal phenotype. And so the converse of that is that if you perturb tissue environments, you will favor a different type. And that type can be malignant. It's not always malignant, but it can be. So malignancy is, the malignant evolution is promoted by an altered environment. And so that alteration could come from the fact that our tissues age and they age in those post-reproductive periods. So it's sort of, you know, sort of the decay of our tissues, but also due to, you know, our lifestyle. So for example, smoking. Smoking completely perturbs the lung environment. So, uh, you know, a stem cell, in, in the lungs of a smoker is basically in a very different environment to what evolution intended it for it to be in. And it, so therefore it's gonna, that cell, there's gonna be pressure on cells in the lungs of a smoker to adapt to that new environment. And by adapting to it, it can basically favor new phenotypes that could lead to a malignancy, that could lead to the uh, initiation of a cancer. So. A lot of people seem to say that cancer is a random mutation in a given cell that starts off a whole cascade, but could it be a forced adaptation that turns into a maladaptation when the cells run out of their bags of tricks in order to be able to adapt? Yeah, so in, in essence, it, it's definitely, I mean, it's not that mutations aren't important, but we just know that mutations aren't enough. So Mutations and, and, you know, other sort of heritable changes in our cells, which include what are known as epigenetic changes, changes to, you know, both the, the methylation state of the DNA, as well as to, uh, you know, the, the proteins like histones that, that decorate our DNA. Some of those changes can also contribute to cancers as well. And those changes are needed. What, what mutations and epigenetic changes create is they create diversity within the population. And so just like in the natural world, evolution only works when there's diversity upon which selection can act. But the direction of that evolution is going to be determined by selective pressures. And those selective pressures are determined by the environment to a large extent. So if you wanted to control cancer, you know, you kind of have two options, avoid the mutations. And I would say that's a very difficult thing to do, you know, beyond the stuff that we know we can do, like not smoking. We are going to get lots of mutations in our cells as we go through life. But we do have the power, I think, to control tissue microenvironments, you know, to control the, the state of the tissue in a manner that could disfavor cancer growth. So what are some of the factors that would contribute to, uh, again, creating an environment that would create cancer? And how do you modulate those factors? Yeah, so, so my lab's shown that inflammation is clearly one of these factors. We know that the sort of chronic inflammation goes up as we get older. We also know that's not equivalent across different humans. So you could take a bunch of 65-year-olds, and some of them will have clear signs of inflammation, and some will not. And clearly, that's in part due to lifestyle. So obesity, smoking, and you know, other unhealthy activities are clearly going to increase your odds of being more inflammatory. On the other hand, it's, it doesn't appear to always be fair. Every, someone could do everything right and still have a more inflammatory phenotype. And that may be in part due to their underlying genetics. So I think that, you know, we, there, there are definitely things we can do to modulate inflammation. And we could do it in experimental animals and we could show that we can limit aging associated cancers. And, I, and I'm pretty confident we can show that this is the case for other types of cancers as well, such as, you know, smoking associated cancers. That said, it's, this isn't something we can sort of do easily because our laboratory mice are in nice sterile environments. But when they have done similar type studies in humans, for example, there was a study where they used an antibody to block an inflammatory protein in humans. And they did this in tens of thousands of people in Europe. And it reduced cancer, lung cancer incidence, about threefold, which is just amazing. But there was no improvement in overall survival because we had an increase in the number of people that died of infections. So it's one of those things we have to approach very carefully because there's, there's kind of two sides to every process. And while too much inflammation is bad, we do need inflammation to fight off infections, to repair our tissues and other processes. So I think we need to get smarter about it. So the bottom line is, I, I think we will be able to figure out sort of how to, you know, tweak factors to limit cancer without the side effects. 
but I don't think we're there yet. Well, inflammation, right, is necessary for wound healing and things like that. And the body seems to naturally call upon it when it's needed. Right. But I guess if someone's in a in an inflamed state for months, years, decades, that predisposes them to cancer. But why wouldn't one of the remedies be then to find out what caused them to be in an inflamed state and to reduce, you know, perhaps with diet, I guess yeah. being tried with drugs, and maybe that would, uh, you know, reduce the, uh, the spread of cancer. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. I think the drug part's the harder part. I think the, the lifestyle is actually a relatively easy one. We, we know how to reduce inflammation. It's exercise, a good diet, maintaining the appropriate weight, not smoking. You know, now, all that said, we're still going to age. And so, you know, it's not like we can completely avoid it, but I think we can increase the odds that we are not going to be one of those unlucky 65-year-olds with inflammation. And we can also sort of push off those periods of tissue decline and inflammation, at least to later ages. And so right now, I think the best approach is sort of a, you know, nothing really fancy. Just do what your, your mother told you to do, right? You know, live a good lifestyle. I think that as we get smarter, though, we will learn that inflammation is not simple. You know, we often just refer to inflammation, but there are different inflammatory factors that mediate, for example, elimination of a bacterial infection that might be, you know, have different characteristics to the type of inflammation that might promote the evolution of a cancer. And so if we can understand those distinctions, we might be able to be more targeted in how we, uh, you know, intervene. The other thing is, I think we might be able to pick the right population of people for which to intervene. So for example, smokers and former smokers, there, there have been trials that have used what are thought of as to be, you know, anti-inflammatories directly delivered to the lung. And at least some parameters indicate that there, there should be a reduced risk of, of lung cancer development. They didn't have a large enough group to really follow to say that there will be a, a reduction of lung cancer. But there are at least parameters in the lung that are normally associated with less lung cancer risk that that uh, were, were associated with the therapy. So I think there's going to be ways to do it, but I think we have to target the right people who are at the highest risk. And I think we need to come up with, with ways that maximize the reduction in cancer while minimizing the cost towards increased, you know, to inability to eliminate bacterial infections, for example. Well, if your focus is inflammation, I, I would think understanding the process and exquisite detail would be very helpful, right. you know, under various conditions. So, I mean, what is, what kind of experimentation are you engaged in in your research and what are you trying to figure out? So we certainly are using anti-inflammatories and, and instead of you know, using something like aspirin that's more sort of non-targeted, we're using, you know, uh, bodies to deplete particular inflammatory mediators known as cytokines. Um, and and look at their impact. But we're also doing other ways that might be more sort of holistic, like manipulating the microbiome and asking if that is able to have an impact on both inflammation and oncogenesis. We also are doing dietary manipulations and asking how those impact inflammation and thus oncogenesis. So we're not solely focused on inflammation, but inflammation is often I think, you know, even when, when, when we manipulate other factors, I think inflammation is going to be one of the downstream parameters that's uh, probably key. Well, in regards to microbiome, what are you doing? What's the experimentation look like? Essentially, what we do is we, we give an older mouse, a younger mouse's microbiome, um, often by directly giving it the, the, the poop of the other mouse. And, you know, and asking, first off, does that improve the, you know, the maintenance of the tissue in question. Uh, we mostly focus on the lung and the, and the blood system. So the, what's known as the hematopoietic system that's in the bone marrow. And so 
we essentially are rejuvenating to some extent, and it's not a complete extent. Almost nothing we can do is complete. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. It's rejuvenating the microbiome of an older mouse. And we're now asking, although we don't have the results yet, whether that will reduce oncogenesis within those two tissues. Um, so you're doing what, fecal transplants between from a young mouse to an old one? Yeah, exactly. And, and vice versa, although we find that the, and we and others have shown that it seems that the, the young microbiome is dominant. So, you know, even when we, we, we do it both ways, it seems like the young mouse's microbiome still stays pretty young. And it's the old mouse's microbiome that seems to benefit from the young microbiome, which is kind of fortunate. Well, how are you, profi- are you profiling the microbiomes before you do the transfer? And are you doing metabolomics? Or are you just looking at, you know, are you doing just 16S or yeah, how are you say, characterizing them? We characterize the microbiome by 16S uh, with some of our collaborators. So it's just by sequencing the, the you know, the, the feces of the, of the mice over time after the transfer. And of course, we have the controls where we didn't transfer. And so we can compare, you know, this is what an old microbiome looks like, and this is what a young microbiome looks like, and they clearly look different. And, you know, what we find is that you get some intermediate state when you put a young microbiome into an old mouse. But if, are you, if you're just doing 16S, I mean, is that providing enough visibility? Are you doing shotgun sequencing as well? Are you looking at metabolomics? We haven't you know, looked at the metabolomics of the feces. We, we, we will probably look at the metabolomics of the tissue because that's our end game. Our, our sort of approach is, is not really to try to figure out what are the particular microbiome constituents that are responsible, because I think that can get very complicated and that's not really our expertise. We want to know if it is causing, you know, sort of a, a more youthful phenotype of the, of the tissue and hopefully like less inflammatory cytokines, then we want to look at the downstream consequences of that. So that it hasn't been our focus. We have been doing essentially, yes, shotgun sequencing of the 16S genes across the different species. So we're getting a whole, you know, plethora. So we can identify all the different species and their abundance within the feces. And we can see how that changes. But again, we're not going to try to go back and say species X is the one responsible for what we're looking for. Well, I understand why, because they would change what they do in the, in, you know, a given bacteria will change what it produces in a different context. You right. know, if the state of the, the somatic cells are different or if the, you know, the cohort of other bacteria, et cetera, but why not look at, uh, or are you looking at metabolomics? Maybe there's an upregulation or downregulation of certain metabolites or short chain fatty acids or things that are needed that the young microbiome produces. The old one didn't. Yeah, it's it's more because that's just not our area of expertise. And, and there are others who have done that. And I, I do believe there are some short chain fatty acids that are known to promote a, a healthy microbiome. And I believe those do go down in older people, although I'm not sure whether those older people are older mice. I'd have to look back at that study. So no, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that's not of interest. It's just not my lab's area. So, you know, we're, we're sort of focusing on the downstream. I mean, I agree that once we figured this out, it would be interesting to go back and say, you know, particularly if you wanted to understand, are there dietary manipulations that might be able to better maintain a youthful microbiome in an older person? Uh, and, you know, it's certainly there are, there, it is known that uh, a poor diet, like, you know, what's known as the sort of the McDonald's diet is not good for maintaining short chain fatty acids in a healthy microbiome. And that, uh, you know, a diet rich in, in, in fibers and stuff like beans and vegetables is good for that but a lot of other groups are working on that that's just not our thing right but you said you're also looking at what the lung tissue and the metabolomics of the cells there yeah so we we have looked at sort of how aging changes changes metabolomics we've looked at it more in the lung been a little more difficult in the hematopoietic system simply because you know there's such a diversity of cell types and we we wouldn't want to just look at a complete random mix of cells but at least in the lung, we can see clear age-dependent changes. And then when we block inflammation, we can reverse a subset of those changes. So what we haven't gotten to the point of understanding cause and effect. Um, so we can't say what are key metabolic changes uh, and how might we manipulate those. So it's not that simple at this point. When you're looking at the, uh, the lung tissue, when you're doing these fecal transplants, um, can mice be induced to have lung cancer? <laughs> 
And yeah, are you doing yeah. the fecal transplants while they have cancer? And, and if yeah, so, so we, like what happens to the cancer? We do the fecal transplants in advance and we're mostly looking at the initiation stage. So what we do is we use viral constructs to introduce in, for example, we're introducing in CRISPR constructs that will induce breaks in the DNA. And we induce, for example, two breaks in this particular chromosome. And this will lead to an inversion of that piece of the chromosome with some frequency that creates fusion oncogenes that are known to drive lung cancers in humans. And so essentially we're, we're, we're engineering exactly what would normally happen in humans during lung cancer genesis, except we're just putting in the, the event. And then we ask, okay, now the event is there, how does that influence outcome? And what we find is that, that the outcome is highly dependent on context. So if we do that in young mice, we get very few tumors that develop. But if we do it in old mice, we get much more tumors that develop. And so now we're asking, well, what if we manipulate the microbiome? What if we block this cytokine? You know, how can we, in other words, reverse that, that aging dependent increase in those tumors? And when we just generally block inflammation, we can prevent it. But we're now trying to get more sort of nuanced in our way of doing that. And one of those ways is through manipulation of the microbiome. Okay. What are you seeing though, without, you know, without messing with the, uh, the chromosomes, if you just do the fecal transplant into a, an older mouse, do they de-age? Do they get younger? And if they already have cancer, lung cancer, what happens to the cancer? Does it retreat? Does it seem yeah. to have no effect? These are, these are pretty new studies. So, I mean, you know, I mentioned that as something we're currently doing. We actually don't have the result in terms of the cancer. We, we, we've only done the manipulations to the point that we know that we can convert, you know, an older mouse's microbiome to a more youthful one and that we can reverse some inflammatory features and that we could show some rejuvenation of, of tissue cells. But we haven't gotten to the point, those experiments are literally cooking right now. But, so I can't tell you what happens to tumor genesis at this point. So these are the experiments that we have ongoing in, in the current time. I wish I wish you would know. I wish, yeah. uh, you know. I, so would we. If I were you, like every day, I'd be like, all right, come on, come on, let's find out. That would be yeah. super exciting to see what happens. You know, when, yeah. how, how long do you think it'll be before you know? All these experiments take months. I mean, so half a year. Okay, not too bad, you know. Well, as an aside, I, I'd love to have you back when you do know, because that'll be sure. really, really, really great data, I'm sure. So if this works, what's, what then would be a, uh, a protocol for people that have lung cancer? Would it be fecal transplants, or does this hint at something else that might be a remedy? Yeah, I think, I think we'd have to... Uh, first off, it, there might be a means to even see who would need it, right? Because... It could be that if there is a, a relatively simple test for the sort of the, the healthiness of your, of your microbiome, you can imagine people could get, you know, a, a, you know, a quick 16S type profiling of the microbiome. So, you know, instead of sending your, your, your sputum to 23andMe, you'd send a little bit of your poop and you get some idea of the health of your microbiome. And I think this should obviously be done with, you know, on, with a doctor, not through something like 23andMe. But let's say that your microbiome indicates that you have a, a, you know, a profile that might be expected to, to be pro-cancer. And it even might be that this isn't just going to be limited to cancer, that this could be you're at an increased risk of heart disease, you're at an increased risk of, of Alzheimer's or whatever. And thus, there could be some way to remedy it. Maybe if, you know, we got smart enough one could have a, a more common pill so you don't have to take someone else's feces, but you could take an actual type of, of a pill that has the right bacterial mix and, you know, sort of like a probiotic, but one that had been thoroughly tested and that might be able to improve your microbiome. Now, the, the thing would be, though, is I think that, you know, Americans often want to just be able to take a pill and be done with it. But I, my bet is that just taking a pill for your microbiome in the, in the absence of changes in behavior. So if you took that pill and you still ate McDonald's every day and you still refused to exercise and you still smoked, I don't think it's going to do any good. But maybe it could be part, you know, because I, I think of the same thing with smokers. I think a lot of interventions that we're thinking about for to reduce lung cancer, I think they're going to be completely wasted on smokers because they're continuing to insult their lungs. But former smokers... I think there's real hope there. And so that might be a one good example is where let's say that we know that the microbiome is particularly perturbed in older smokers. 
if they quit smoking, maybe there'd be a way to sort of more rapidly restore the normalcy of their microbiome through some sort of probiotic. Um, so I think this is all very possible, and, and the hope would be that it would be relatively low harm type intervention. You know, it would be really interesting if you're able to take a fecal sample from someone, and then they undergo chemotherapy for lung cancer, and then you do a, a self and auto fecal transplant into them after the chemotherapy, and perhaps that might, I don't know, put them on a better path. Yeah, well, I know they do do fecal transplants for people that undergo certain therapies that like particularly antibiotic therapies that that destroy their own microbiome. So, you know, those are obviously already used. I That would be an interesting idea to do. And I don't know how much is being used in the context of chemotherapy. You know, given that I'm not a clinician, I'm I, that just may be outside of my realm. But, you know, it, it, it's something that where one would need to, to, to do the studies to, you know, probably starting off in animal models and then eventually into people to show that this was actually useful. Yeah, it just might be an interesting thing for you to, you know, to consider. I don't know if mice ever are exposed to chemo when they have cancer or they're just observed to see what naturally happens to them. But, you know, oh, on a mouse, it might be something you could try. If, you know, let's say it does work, like, you know, a mouse has lung cancer and you transplant the microbiome and it gets better, you could try with the, uh, you know, again, with chemo and then transplanted too and see what happens. Oh, absolutely. That'd be an interesting experiment. Yeah, no, I mean, many, many chemotherapeutics are worked out of mice first. So that's, yeah. Okay. Mouse protocols for chemotherapeutics is are used all the time. It's only about an extra $100,000 in funding to do it, right? I'm just kidding. Way more. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the experiment. Any given experiment isn't $100,000. But, you know, obviously, if you if you were to do a full study and really try to understand the process, yeah, that's probably on the order of $100,000. I was kind of joking with you, like, you know, <laughs> oh, just throw another $100,000. I know it's not so easy, but you know. yeah. anyway. Okay, so that's that's microbiome. And let's return back to what, what are the other main things that you're considering in terms of, uh, you know, reducing lung cancer? Yeah, I think for, you know, I think one perspective that we need to take if we want to think about reducing cancer incidence is we we in some ways need to, to stop just thinking about cancer itself and think about sort of the overall health of the body. Because I think what's becoming really clear is the same people that have a higher risk for cancer have a higher risk for other diseases like heart disease and you know neural decline. And it's because a lot of these are are, are linked to sort of this systemic decline. And so obviously the, the commonalities are things like how old you are, whether you've smoked, how obese you are. But I think that if we start to understand the sort of systemic changes that are driving these different processes, you know, and I'm not just talking about inflammation, I'm talking about sort of sort of just overall systemic changes that could be, you know, metabolites in your serum. It could be your your level of platelets and the ease of clotting. It could be changes in the extracellular matrices throughout your body. These sorts of changes are creating, you know, contexts that don't just favor cancer evolution, but favor disease in general. And so I think if we take a more, you know, holistic view of disease and realize that they're really quite linked, I think we're going to be able to reduce risk of multiple different diseases at once. Uh, and certainly this is the case with interventions. I mean, like exercise. Exercise pretty much reduces the risk of almost everything you can think of. Yeah, very interesting. Very good. What, what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Where can they go? Well, obviously, I wrote a book called Adaptive Oncogenesis. That's not a bad way to start. I mean, that's a, that sort of describes our overall theory and way of thinking about what, we're, what we do. Otherwise, uh, I've written not only, you know, scientific, you know, papers for the scientific community, but also with my colleague, Bob Gattenby, we wrote a, an article in Scientific American that... Um, I think could be a sort of a good way for someone to, you know, sort of understand our evolutionary perspective on, you know, both cancer genesis as well as cancer therapy. That's well, probably one thing I haven't, easy. one thing I haven't asked you is you, you mentioned many times now cancer in an evolutionary context. Can you expand upon what you mean by that? Yes. I mean, in two ways, I mean, understanding why we get cancer, you know, and why different animals get cancer and when they get cancer understanding that from an evolutionary process. So as I started off in this podcast talking about, is that first we need to understand it sort of from that life history perspective. You know, we get, we evolved, we and other animals evolved to not get cancer to the point that it would benefit our reproductive success. So you can imagine there's very strong selection 
against cancer in a 20 year old because that would impair that that person's ability to pass their genes on but there's really not such strong selection against cancer in a 65 to 75 year old because the the odds at least you know historically that that person would be contributing to the next generation was quite low and then we need to understand well what are those mechanisms that we've evolved to prevent cancer and and this is where you know I've talked about how the simple maintenance of tissues is intrinsically cancer suppressive. It prevents cancer just as that maintenance of tissues helps us maintain our fitness, helps us you know, fight off predators, and helps us not get other diseases. And so I think there's this sort of common linkage between this evolution of t- tissue maintenance and, and the ability to fight off not just cancer, but other diseases as we get older. But we have to also understand why those mechanisms decline in older ages, because those mechanisms are expensive. They require input. And for most of our evolutionary history, resources were scarce. We didn't have infinite amounts of food. And so if you're going to invest your energetic resources in something, you're going to limit how long you invest in tissue maintenance, because any additional investment in tissue maintenance will mean lack of investment in things like reproduction, which is very energetically expensive, making a baby or multiple babies, depending on what kind of animal you are. And so there's been this balance. And I think if we understand that balance better and we understand those investment pathways, we will be able to better develop means to, you know, both avoid cancer in the first place and even to better treat it. Also, why the focus on uh, lung cancer? Why not other cancers? I know you have to pick something, but why for you in particular lung? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is is, is that if we were to to develop interventions, there's there's an obvious population of people who would be targeted. So, you know, as you know, some cancers seem to just sort of strike people when they get old, but there's no clear indication that there are particular risk factors for them. Or even if there are such risk factors, they're, they're, they're not so dominant that you can, you can easily pick out a group of people who would be, you know, eligible for an intervention. But smoking obviously makes people very much at risk of lung cancer. That, and it's a very common disease and a very poorly treatable disease. So that made it a good target. But the other reason with lung cancer was, and it's also partly that my institution has a real strength in lung cancer. So I had a lot of good colleagues around me. But the other reason is because in some ways it's a very accessible tissue. And you might not normally think about that, but you know, pulmonologists will regularly do bronchoscopies where they stick a, you know, a little small tube with a camera at the end of it down somebody's, you know, um, through someone's bronchi, and they can actually sample bits of the lung of a person, you know, which which is considered relatively non-invasive. It's not a surgery. The person does have to be put under anesthesia, but it's still relatively non-invasive. And so we actually can have samples of humans over time. We also have the ability, because it's essentially a surface tissue, to introduce oncogenic events into mice through just inhalation of particular types of viruses that we can engineer to carry these oncogenic mutations without actually doing much manipulation of the mouse otherwise. So Mm. it has a lot of advantages, both as an experimental system and as sort of for the ability to clinically target it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've heard a generic statistic, I don't know who I've heard it from, but multiple people, that lung cancer is on the rise from non-smokers. Have you... Do you know about this? And if so, what would be your speculation as to why? Yeah, you know, I'd have to, certainly the fraction of lung cancers from non-smokers is going up, but that's because smoking rates have gone down. So there's always been, you know, in the United States, 15, 20% of lung cancers are not associated with smoking, known as cancers of never smokers. So these aren't former smokers, these are never smokers. So, but as as the number of smokers declines, the fraction that of non-smoking cancers will go up. Now, I don't know if the actual numbers are going up. If they are, I wasn't aware of that. And but and also you'd also have to age correct it because obviously, you know, even just over the last century, we have more people that are, for example, living past 65. And so the more people that live old, to longer older ages, the more cancers that you will get that is simply is simply associated with the fact that we're older. Okay. Well, very good. Well, again, James, what's the best way, again, for people to find out more about you? Like, what's what's the title of the article in Scientific American? And what's your lab website or best way to see more about you? Yeah, I mean, fortunately, my last name is incredibly unique. So if you Google me, you're going to get to my lab website relatively easily. And and I don't remember the, the Scientific American article off the top of my head. But if you, if you look for my name plus Gattenby, which is G-A-T-E-N-B-Y, Bob Gattenby, or we 
more formally Robert, you'll find that Scientific American article. And the book I wrote, which is published by, by Harvard Press, is Adaptive Oncogenesis. Okay. So a real simple uh, shortcut is for listeners, look up James De Gregory, D-E-G-R-E-G-O-R-I on Google, and that'll probably lead you to uh, all this stuff. So yeah, James, uh, yeah, thank you for coming. I'm glad you're working on what you're working on, and I appreciate you being here. Sure. It's great talking to you, Rich, uh, and I look forward to talking to you again. Take care. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.